Clearly, he wrote for him, required incredible commitment from him. He's a, a performer who had a flair for committing. But when he was on stage, and apparently, tell me if it's true, was there oxygen on the side of the stage? And he's a guy who obviously is a little heavy. Uh, you know, yeah, so there was a. Do you ever have a sense of guilt and concern that this guy was going to implode or kill himself on stage? None whatsoever. I um, I probably, if I had thought that, would have wondered if I had the song ready to be his, you know, expiration song. Um, no, it was it's just something I accepted about him. He gave more than any performer I ever know. Uh, he, you know, he he was the embodiment of the cliche. He gave 150 percent, which he did. Um, it's the only way he knew how to perform. It's what got him into trouble. It's why he lost his voice. He had an operatic voice. You can't use an operatic voice six times a week. And that first year, unfortunately, the tour was booked like six nights a week sometimes. Um, Sonnenberg, his manager, was in this difficult position of trying to break a record by the rules, certain rules he had to play, but didn't fit him. I mean, I thought he shouldn't have been doing more than three a week, but there was no way to do that. And so um, he just wrecked his voice really quickly, and they didn't give him time to recover. I remember he wanted time to recover. He would plead for it, but he wasn't given it just get back out there. Um, and the oxygen was on stage. There was this tent where he would go for oxygen. And, and he would always faint after the show. I don't even know how much of this he could control or not. Some of it might have been the character, but the character was real, so there's really no distinction. Um, the horrifying part of him at the end, fainting, was, for me, <laughs> I would come off a mass of sweat, too, and he'd be usually on the floor completely naked. This is quite a sight, to see Meatloaf on the floor completely naked. And um, his general act, I try to avoid it, but generally what he'd do is he'd reach up, and it's a sweet thing, but for me it was terrifying. He'd go, Jimmy, Jimmy, I did it again! And he'd grab me and pull me down on him. And suddenly I'm in this porno movie with this sperm whale, and I'm terrified. <laughs> I'm lying there, you know, doing a lot of Moby Dick again. <laughs> and I'm wondering when the spout's going to go off and what's going to come out. And um, He's going, Jimmy, Jimmy, and you know, it was it was a sweet gesture, you know, but to him, it was this, it was a huge athletic ordeal, and a huge, it was like basic training every show for a marine. He um, he wanted it to be that, and that was part of the thrill of it. He was he was he was always on the edge himself, of they say expiring, you know, so to speak. Um, I mean, there are probably ways he could have done it without getting in so much trouble if he wanted to spend more time on technique exercise such. But it would have been the same meatloaf. It would have been the same thrilling sense of danger. And he was really like the character in Bad Out of Hell. He was always that, that close to immolation, you know. Just, you did think, especially if you saw the steam coming out of his body, you expected he could spontaneously combust, like at any point. He seemed like that kind of performer. Again, that spoiled me in that, uh, not to be the old fogey again, but you know, when I see bands today, there's very few I can see spontaneously combusting. I mean, again, there are very few you can see even coming close to a boil if you leave them on a hot fire for 40 hours. They stand up there in their stupid clothes and they groan on and on. And This is unfortunately what VH1 has to deal with. I know that from speaking to them. They say, what do we do with these bands? You know, it's not like they're overflowing with personality and uh, showmanship, not to mention the other extreme, which is mythology, which is above that. So um, that was the thrilling thing about Meatloaf. And that, I think, was the thing that offended the other camp, so to speak, which, strangely enough to me, personally, was a lot of the people who were associated with Springsteen, uh, who was one of the greatest showmen of all time, but the people around him were pathetic sycophants. They still are. Dave Marsh, I think he's still alive. Pretty pathetic. Oh, I wanted to bring down for you to read Lester Bangs, a great review by Lester Bangs, the great rock critic. Uh, it was only sent to me two weeks ago. I'd never read it in 1978. Great piece, just raving about Bad Hell as one of the great albums of all time and destroying darkness on the edge of town. And it was, it was really a great, like everything you wrote, really wonderfully bracing, anarchistic kind of rebellious piece. But um, a lot of these people around Springsteen were like, you know, hated the show because it was so much, you know, Bruce on stage was exciting because it was Bruce. This was me being a character in a created world, and that somehow seemed to them a violation of something about rock and roll, which I thought was really stupid. But um, it certainly was the only act I could think of at the time doing that, except for things like Kiss, and uh, Alice Cooper, which were a little different, much more stylized comic book. Though I loved them, I remember seeing Kiss, uh, their first show ever at the Mercer Arts Center in New York, in a little room, Kiss in a tiny room. And I was a huge fan of theirs forever. I, I bought my apartment from Gene Simmons, their bass player, 
And I remember, you know, his attitude to the group wasn't, didn't seem to show mo much respect for the group musically. It was more a business proposition. He's a brilliant businessman. I was the one who was saying, no, don't underestimate it. You guys are dealing with mythology. It's brilliant. I thought Kiss was brilliant in that sense. And Alice Cooper was too. I mean, to me, those were all huge steps forward. Um, even to this day, you know. I don't care what the music's like. I'll always love Insane Clown Posse. I always love Slipknot. It wouldn't matter if they were doing only Barry Manilow songs. I consider them brilliant because I wish there were more groups like that. I get getting so tired, I was tired in the 60s of it, of people walking out on stage like they are in real life. I just, coming from a theater background, when you walk out on the stage, you have an obligation almost to leave your real life behind and to assume another identity, visually, emotionally, viscerally. And, um, and me did that, I think it screwed them up a lot. But, um, Wherever I started with this thought. <laughs>